Well, there it is, the big bad wolf, number seven. Why the fixation on one number? I mean, you know this, it controls the entire game. It tells you when you win, when you lose, and from the casino standpoint as well, how much you win or lose. They use the probability of that seven showing versus the other number to determine the pay schedule for every bet that you place on the table. They know that it comes on average once every six times. That's standard probability. Knowing that, if they keep the game random, they can predict over millions of rolls what they're going to make in profit per hour. Now, if you flip that around and say, well, if we can control the math, if we can control that seven showing a little bit less often or a little more often, if you control the math, you control the money. And the controlled shooting community knows that if they can flip it a little bit, they can really change the outcome of the game and where that money lands. So is it possible? How do they do it? And why are they so fixated on it? Let's find out together. I'm John. This is ProCrafts. And let's dig in deeper to the number seven. Welcome to our deep dive on the seven. We're going to do a bunch of things today. And first and foremost, I want to remind you of some of the survey results that we had when we talked to our controlled shooters. And then I want to dive into the math of the seven just a little bit. I don't want to get too algebraic on you, but I want to show you how we calculate house edge and what it really means if you can tweak the appearance of the seven by just a little bit. I've got a live roll to show you. We're going to use some, some software to simulate thousands of rolls with the seven probability being tweaked just a little bit. And we might even take a look at some dice and see how controlled shooters are trying to manipulate the dice to stave off or increase the showing of the seven. So all that coming up here in a minute. Let's get started first by looking at the survey results and reminding ourselves why we're here in the first place. Why we're here, right? Why are we talking about the seven when we should be talking about controlling the dice? Well, the reason for that is this. I put the survey out to ask the dice controllers why they set the dice. Why are you trying to practice dice control and spend all your money and all your time on this craft? Well, here's the answer. 72% of the respondents said the number one reason that they do this is to avoid the seven, learn how to avoid the seven. Why? Well, there's two main reasons for this. One, if you can avoid the seven, you can elongate your roles. The longer your role goes before the seven shows up, the more opportunities you have to hit numbers that are going to pay. That's the, the easy and obvious answer. But the side answer to that is that if you're not rolling sevens, if the seven comes less often, that means that numbers that pay are coming more often. By decreasing the probability of the seven showing, you increase the probability of other numbers showing. And that, I think, is kind of the understated but side goal of the whole process. Now, how does it work and what does the math look like? Well, that's next. We're going to dive in right now and look at the math of the seven and see how the probabilities work and how the house edge works. <clears throat> so what is the big deal? right? We talked about this earlier. The seven comes six out of 36 rolls on average, one out of six, 16.67% of the time. That's the, the raw math of basic random probability of the dice rolling. We know this to be fact, okay? Now, as I said earlier, everything is based on those numbers. The casino has, you know, etched their fortunes from the craps tables based on those numbers holding true. So there are measures put in place, the bounciness of the tables, the diamond shaped back wall that are there to ensure that there is this randomness. They want to make sure that every roll is quote unquote random, that it sticks to these probabilities because all of the payouts that they've come up with for every of every one of the bets is based on that bet winning versus the probability of the seven rolling. If those numbers change, things get a little bit squirrely. Let's take a look at house edge now and see how this is calculated. I think a lot of folks think that the house edge is the probability that the casino has of winning over you. That's partially true. The probabilities are that, what chance they're going to win over you. The house edge is actually a spiff or a commission that they take off the top of every winning bet based on the probability. So for an example here, look at the, at the four and the 10. The four and the 10 each have three ways to roll versus six ways to roll a seven. Okay. That means you've got a two to one disadvantage. Those bets should pay you two to one. However, a $10 bet pays you only $18. They pay this thing on a nine to five payout schedule, which there's the house edge. 
if you won the bet, instead of getting paid what the actual odds of winning that bet are, you get paid a little bit less. And that's the casino over millions of rolls, siphoning just enough off of that to have a predictable profit. The same happens on the five and the nine. The five and the nine, you've got a three to two disadvantage. Right, so a bet of ten dollars should pay you three to two or fifteen to ten. No, they pay you fourteen bucks. They're taking that buck off of your winnings every single time. Six and the eight, no different, just a little smaller scale there. The six and the eight, let's say you've got a thirty dollar bet on the six, it should pay thirty six because the six and the eight, you're at a five to six disadvantage. But instead, they pay you thirty five again, siphoning off that extra buck at the end of every single bet. And that's the house edge. So the casino calculates house edge with a interesting little math formula, which I'll show you here in a minute, that's based on the probability of the numbers coming versus the seven. Here's the math for the house edge. Now, I've gotten this formula from the website wizardofodds.com run by Michael Shackelford. Guy's an amazing mathematician. He breaks every casino game down in terms of odds, probability, house edge. It's a wonderful read. If you're into math at all, um, he really does a good job of breaking down and explaining to you. I'm not giving you a math lesson here. I'm going to break down the smallest possible formula here, which is this. The house edge, as you can see, is based on a calculation of the probability of winning a bet divided by the probability of winning it plus the probability of losing the bet. This little formula is baked into every single bet on the table. And it's what results in that math we saw earlier of you getting paid a little bit less than actual odds on every bet. So here's the deal. What does it matter that we have this calculation in front of us? Well, the simple thing is this. What if, what if you could change it? What would happen if you were to decrease the seven from six out of 36 to five and a half out of 36? How would that change? Because the P value in the formula is that. Your odds of losing or winning the bet go from being based on a six out of 36 chance to a five and a half out of 36 chance, or even a five out of 36 chance if you get really good at shooting. This changes everything. This math formula, this calculation changes drastically. It changes the money in an exponential way if you can just flip the bit a little bit and go from six out of 36 down to five and a half or five out of 36. I wanna show you here um, with some software, what it looks like over the course of thousands of trials to do exactly this. What is the actual impact of changing the probability of the seven? How does it change the math? And how does it change that profit per hour that the casinos are looking at? It's fascinating. Let's take a look at WinCraps and see how that actually works. Here we are in WinCraps. And if you don't know, WinCraps is an application for Windows that lets you basically play craps. You can set up your strategies and roll dice. It also has a great feature, which is automatic betting. So I can set up a script that will bet for me, and then I can run it in automations. We can say, let's take that betting strategy and run it a thousand times or whatever to see how, how well it performs over time. So what I've got set up for us here is a pretty simple yet aggressive right side strategy. And I want to see, as we run this in simulation, what the effect of holding off the seven actually has. So what we're going to do is start off with a pass line bet of 25 bucks. And when we get a point established, let's get one that's going here, we're gonna get a, a bet all the way across at the $25 level plus maximum odds behind the line. So again, very aggressive right side play. I'm not suggesting this is a strategy that you should actually employ, but because of the way that we're gonna manipulate the way the seven shows up in these trials, it's gonna give us a really good look at how we can A, elongate rolls, and B, what is the effect of having every box number bet when their probabilities increase first to seven. So we'll start here, and what I'm gonna do is show you the configuration of the randomizer before I start rolling it out. Let's go ahead and switch to the configuration screen here, and I'll show you the way that WinCraft is set up by default. Now, by default, it uses regular probability. So you'll see that the six, or the seven rather, is set to default where it's gonna show six out of every 36 times. And because we're at standard probability, the six and the eight will then show up five out of 36 times, the five and nine, four out of 36, and the four and 10, three out of 36. Everything really is on standard probability here. So as I roll this out, we're gonna take a couple of shots at it here. We're gonna clear out our bankroll between sessions 
and then I'll go to the rolling screen and you'll see how this works. So as I close this window out, I'm going to do this once. And what I'm going to do is, is go game, new, reset. It'll reset our game for us, clears out all, this, all of the uh, statistics, and resets our bankroll to $1,000. Then I'll head over to, this, to, to the stat screen here where I can do the automatic rolling. From this screen, I can start it in what's called hyperdrive mode. It's going to roll 120 rolls per hour simulated very fast. You'll see how quick this thing goes. And I'm going to do this multiple times here. Um, I won't show you me going back and forth between resetting the bankroll. I'll keep coming back to this screen though and rerunning it from zero so we can get a couple of trials in to see how that aggressive right side strategy works with standard probability. So here's the first test run. Actually it ended out pretty quick. We ended up with, let's see, uh, 62 rolls to zero. Um, we did show a, a profit at one point of 250 bucks, which isn't bad. And again, it's a pretty aggressive play. So if it goes south, it goes south really quick because of that spread. Let's go ahead and reset it and we'll try it again. Okay, the stats have been reset. Let's run it again. And once again, we end pretty quickly. We zeroed out after this time 54 rolls, but we showed a better profit. We had a pretty good start, it looks like, and we got up to a profit of 645. I'll clear stats one more time. We'll do it. We'll do it again. Okay, we've cleared the stats and, and reset our bankroll. Let's try it again. A little bit longer run that time. That's pretty good. Looks like we got about 350 rolls in there. That's great. Um, we almost doubled our bankroll. We got to a high of 1980. That's a really good run here. Um, and again, with an aggressive strategy like that, if you catch a good run, you got a lot of money out there, so it stands to reason that we'll make some more money. And here was a pretty good long, long series of rolls that actually performed really well. I want to do one more trial just to get a fourth one in the books here. Okay, we've cleared our, our stats and reset the bankroll. Let's do our final run. Well, that was a much better run. We lasted 350 rolls. At one point, our profit was up to 1800 bucks, which is really solid. And what we're seeing here with the standard distribution or standard probability, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. You're seeing very short roll lengths and very long roll lengths here. We're getting kind of our bankrolls getting getting tortured between the short and long rolls. It's hard to predict. And that's what you'd expect with random. I do want to show you something. Now, we see this here as players, as a lot of peaks and a lot of valleys. But I want to show you what the casino sees. The casino sees this session like this because, again, they're looking at these things over you know, millions, perhaps billions of rolls over time. They don't experience those peaks and valleys like you and I do. We're here for the short run. And so as our bankroll experiences the rolls, we get into these really big valleys and peaks and our bankroll takes a hit or a surge. As a result, the casino, because everything is random and predictable, predictably random, I suppose, they know that they're going to find pockets like this, but over time it all feels pretty flat to them. So with that said, what I want to do now is switch gears and let's alter the appearance of the seven by just a little bit and see if it changes the way that this strategy performs. Let's open up the configuration screen now and change the probability of the seven. Now, what I want to show you here is this. Wincraps allows us to make a change to how often numbers appear so you can kind of simulate different scenarios. So here we're going to go and unlock the page and we're going to set the seven to show up just every 5.5 times instead of every six times. I'll get that activated for us here too. And notice what happened to the other numbers. The six and the eight now have a higher than five out of 36 chance to show. The five and nine, a higher than four chance and the four and 10, of course, a higher than three chance because when you take that half a roll away from the seven, from it appearing six times out of 36 to five and a half times, the system will automatically spread out that half a roll per 36 amongst the other numbers relatively equally based on their given probability. So what you're going to see here is the seven shows up a little bit less. Everything else shows up a little bit more. It'll be interesting to see how the strategy performs now, given that slight change that we just made. I'm going to clear this out. We'll get a new bankroll going and we'll run another couple of simulations with the slight change to the seven made here. Let me get everything uh, cleared out and reset and we'll, and we'll start out with a few new Sims. Okay. okay. Now here we see a difference. 
just holding back the seven a little bit, look at what's happened here. We're going off. I've stopped it. We're going off into oblivion. Um, we actually have, we're at 2,300 rolls and high profit of $13,000, which is interesting because it was a very slight change that we made. Just holding back the seven a little bit increased the probability of the other numbers just enough that they hit early enough to allow us to get into this really amazing streak here. I'm going to stop this and go back and run another one. I want to see how this reacts uh, over a few runs back to back to make sure that we didn't just find an aberration. Okay, we'll do another run with the seven at five and a half per 36. Let's see how this one goes. Okay, that time it didn't go off crazy town, but we did get a pretty interesting looking arc here where we've got a good win percentage, right? We ended up with a $2,700 profit at one point here. And you can see again that that curve, we saw the same sort of shaped curve in the earlier trial with the seven at the regular uh, at the regular probability. And again, a pretty good win. And then we get this bad streak of losses because the seven still comes, right? The way the dice work doesn't change just because you're changing the frequency by which it shows up. Let's go ahead and clear this out and do another one. We'll do a few more of these at this level. Okay, things are cleared out and we've reset the bankroll. Let's run this again. Okay, and again, we're seeing this sort of this big rise and it's going to go off and it seems like keep going here. There are some ebbs and flows to it. You can see the fact that it does go up and down over time. Uh, I'll stop the thing here. And th the note to be made is that again, when the sevens held off just a little bit, if you catch it early where the bankroll doesn't get, get crushed early in the process, it'll go and go and go that little bit of a tweak. It doesn't take much to really make things go, go almost insane. Let's try it again. Okay. The bankroll has been reset and all the stats wiped. Let's go ahead and do it. Another trial here with the seven at five and a half per 36. And again, we've got this pretty strong rise. doesn't take much again with that seven, holding it back a little bit to see this kind of activity. Let's go ahead and stop it. So we've had three chances now where we've seen the same sort of activity uh, with the seven being held back just a slight amount. I'm going to reset things and do one more trial just to make sure that we're not again seeing aberrations here, but this is more the norm. Okay. Cleared everything out once again. Let's give it one more go. And again, it starts out kind of even, and then it really starts to rock it up. You do see, again, you do see down streaks and up streaks with this for sure, because the seven is still a thing, but you'll see that our bankroll is consistently rising and we're lasting into the thousands of rolls. I'm going to go ahead and stop this. Ooh, there was a big downtrend there. Um, but yeah, what you see here, I think, is a pretty clear indication of holding back the seven so it shows less, allows the rolls to go longer, and within the longer rolls, each of the numbers has now a higher percentage or higher probability of itself showing. I want to go ahead and take this one step further and wind the seven back to where it shows up every five times out of 36 instead of every five and a half times. Let's see if that makes a difference as well. Let's reopen the probability screen. We'll configure this one more time. And... I want you to watch what I do here. I'm going to change the seven from showing every five and a half times down to every five times. Let's watch what happens here. This is very interesting. When I go to five, look what happens to the six and the eight. Now, I got to renote this. Windcraps, the way I've got it configured here, will spread evenly the remaining numbers. So if the seven comes out one less time per 36 than it should, it spreads out that one across all the numbers equally according to the regular probability. Now, the, five, the, the six and the eight here, have now surpassed the seven as dominant numbers, which means when the seven comes every six out of 36 times, it is the dominant number, which is why you see the trends always pointing down to zero over long periods of time. Here, the six and the eight are now both more powerful than the seven. Just by pulling the seven down to one less show every 36 rolls, you've increased the six and the eight now to being what I would call hyper dominant. They're gonna really dominate the way that our roles look here. And of course the five and nine and four and 10 also have increased their chances of coming. Now Windcrafts allows me to go in here and actually tweak the six and the eight and the five, whatever individually, I'm not going to do that. We're going to keep it as simple as possible here and just let the program reassign that one extra role that we're losing from the seven across the rest of them equally. Now let's go back and reset our bank roll and run a few trials and see how this responds uh, over time. Okay, here we are at the auto roll screen now with the seven set to showing every five 
out of 36 times. And again, the six and the eight now have surpassed the seven in terms of dominance. Let's see what effect that has here over many, many rolls. And you'll see almost immediately you get this kind of meteoric rise and it's going to keep on rolling and rolling and rolling here. Again, when the six and the eight become dominant over the seven, this is what you'd expect to see. Two numbers showing more often than the one that's going to get you. Now, you can see a little downturn there. That will happen at some point. But look where we are money-wise. We're up into the $30,000 range. Let me stop this. And we'll close it down. I'm going to reset the bankroll. And we'll restart it one more time. Back at the auto roll screen, now we have uh, reset the bankroll, reset our stats, and we're still set with the seven coming every five times out of 36. Let's see how it responds on this run. And it looks about the same. We're starting off kind of flat, but then we get that rise again. And what you see, just like the last time, the 6 and the 8 dominance really makes this thing kind of rise quickly. And again, suppressing the 7 has a big time effect on the length of rolls. And again, because of this, the distribution of the other numbers appearing more often, look what happens to the bankroll here. Let's stop it. I'm going to run it again. Um, and again, I want to, I want you to see a trend forming here as we do this a few times, uh, just to kind of see that um, this is not an aberration, but this is kind of how this works when you set this thing over the course of thousands of rolls. Everything's cleared out and reset. Let's run it again. And we're seeing that same trend where it starts out a little bit soft. Here's kind of treading water. Oh, look at that. It actually zeroed out. That's interesting. Um, that hasn't happened before. Uh, this time we got to a little over a thousand rolls, which is good. And a high point of 3370. That's actually really good to see. Um, very rarely do I see this zero out when I run it this way. Let's try that one more time and see if we can't make that happen again. Everything's been reset. Let's run it again. And it seems like we always start out flat. And now we're in this pattern where we're getting down. Look at that. That's twice in a row where it went really high and twice in a row where it went relatively medium speed rolls here, 551 with a high profit of 2460. Let's run it again and see where we land. Once again, everything has been reset. Let's go ahead and start the auto roll and see what happens. Okay, this time it climbed up quick. What I'm noticing here is that if it gets off to a halfway decent start, it'll climb forever. If it gets off to a bad start is when you have that sort of trouble spot where it goes down to zero. But here again, we're going to be in the 14, 15,000. That's a pretty good down streak there. Um, but then it climbs up into oblivion again. Let's stop it. So we've had three really strong runs. We've had a couple of runs where it's fair to Midland, but still 500,000 rolls, which is longer than you typically see before you zero out. That's actually pretty impressive compared to regular probability. If you remember way back, when our rolls were 50 and 60 and 120 in length, we're seeing some pretty good strides here. Let me stop this, and I want to run it one more time, again, just to get an idea, once again, if we're into a pocket or not. Everything is cleared out. Bankroll's reset. Let's run it one final time. And here we get off to a really strong start, and you can see already that it's climb, climb, climbing. And I'm going to stop it right there. And I want to make a, a point here. Now, it should be made very clear here. I'm not saying that if you can control the dice, if you are a dice controller and you think you're pretty good at it and you're able to mathematically, in your estimation, hold the seven back to showing five out of 36 times like, we're, like we did here in simulation mode, I'm not suggesting that playing that strategy, you're going to win $10,000, $18,000, or $30,000. That's not the point of this exercise. Again, look at this from the casino's point of view. Okay, When I showed you earlier the graph that looks like this where it's kind of highs and lows, the casino saw it flat because over time, the casino doesn't experience peaks and valleys. Over time, it's relatively flat, and they've got that little bit of an edge where they're siphoning off and taking a little bit out of each of your bets to make their, their mortgage payments, essentially. You, if you're able to change the math, I said earlier, if you can change the math, you can change the money. This is what that looks like. If you can change the math to where the seven becomes less dominant and other numbers become more dominant, you can also change the money. And in fact, this edge that the casino has would be flipped if you could hold the seven off to five out of 36 times. The edge totally flips into the player's favor. You can see how the money happens. And I want you to think about this very carefully. When the seven comes as expected, six out of 36 times, 
See how fast this money rose up in a few thousand rolls? You earn 10K. The casino's doing the same thing. On their side, when the seven comes like it should, they're making that kind of money on every thousand rolls. That's the way the math works for the casino. If you can control the dice, right? And that's a big if. If a dice controller can hold the seven off, making other, no other numbers more dominant, this is the effect. You flipped the edge and you become, quote unquote, the house. And now you have the edge. And again, over time, you're going to see it flat because you're just going to be siphoning in the way that it works. Now, again, full disclaimer here. I'm not suggesting that this strategy that I've rolled out here, 25 pass, full odds, 160 across, because you think you can throw the dice well, is not a pathway to $10,000 a session. Okay, That's not what I'm suggesting. This is a mathematical simulation with a computer program, but I wanted to show you if you could simulate that many rolls at random, at slightly less than random, and at a controlled level, what does it look like? To me, it's a pretty big eye-opener. When I see these numbers, when I see the, 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 the chart go this way, it's an eye-opener. It really does show how powerful the seven is and what can happen if you can slightly control how often it appears. Pretty amazing, really. And again, this, this, uh, this way of looking at it, we had a couple of really strong runs, a couple of ugly ones, but that's to be expected with a, if you get a slow start. I just think it's fascinating how, how drastic a change it was from straight probability to going to seven, showing five and a half out of 36. And now here with the seven at five out of 36, it's a pretty telling story what happens when you can control, if you can control the appearance of the seven. Well, like I said, that's fascinating to me. When you, I, I, when I started this process, um, I knew that that tweaking the appearance of the seven was going to have an impact. I didn't realize how drastic of an impact it was going to have when I saw those numbers come out like that. And I can tell you that in prepping for these videos in this series, I ran that same simulation in Windcrafts hundreds of times because I couldn't believe that it was actually going to work that way, and it always does. With default probability, you lose your money, generally speaking, in 300 rolls or less, almost like clockwork. And again, the casino knows this and depends on that. That's the seven-based math that they use to calculate all of their house edges. When you change the number of sevens from six out of 36 to five and a half or five, it always goes in that thing. You almost never not get, in this case, in Windcrafts, to over at least a 100% win, 2,000 bucks. Usually I'm in, the, I'm in the 10,000s and I've only seen it lose all of its money a handful of times. It's insane to me just how a small tweak to the probability drastically changes the money. Like I said before, you control the math, you control the money. And it completely is obvious now why the controlled shooting community is very fixated on holding off the seven and why everything they do and talk about is about reducing the appearance of the seven. And what I believe and what I've seen in a lot of comments is folks that are on the dice control is impossible or the anti dice control crowd, they seem to be fixated on a couple of things. One is they don't like the messaging or the people, the dice controllers versus the practice of it. But I think that the, the thought is that people think dice controllers are trying to control the dice and pick specific numbers. And that's not the case. The dice controlling community is really trying to hold off the seven by just a little bit to change that house edge to get that dramatic effect. So all that said, what does it take? How does a dice controller actually try to impart any kind of control over the dice? Let's take a look real quick. Okay, so before we can talk about how a dice controller might try and hold off the seven, let's take a quick look at how we get a seven. So it comes down to dice theory. So every die is constructed the same way where the opposite side of whatever face is showing always adds with it to seven. So the five and the two are always gonna be opposite of each other. We call them sister numbers. And again, the six, the opposite of a six is a one. And again, the five and the two and the three and the four. The opposite side of the die is always going to add to seven, which is one part of it. The second part of it, though, is you've got always two dice. Okay, so when you've got two dice, what happens is this. The second die always has the opposite side. So whatever this, this die lands on, this die can always match it and become a seven, no matter what one die stops on. If it's the six in this case, the other die always has the one. You can always make a seven out of two dice. Other numbers aren't the same. For example, if the first die lands and a three is showing, you can't make a 10 
an 11 or a 12 out of this, okay? The seven is super powerful because you can always match those sister numbers up and that's kind of a big deal, okay? So there's how the seven appears, but what does the dice controller have to do to stave it off? How does the dice controller impart any kind of control over the dice to make the seven show up five out of 36 instead of seven out of 36 times? It's a pretty tough hill to climb, but let's take a look at what they're trying to do. The avoidance of the seven comes in a few different forms and a controlled shooter has to overcome quite a bit of things to make the seven not show up. But here's their attack plan, okay? The number one thing they do is they set the dice. Now here what I've got in front of you is what's called the hard ways set, which means you've got the hard two, four, five, and six around the outside of the die. And what the dice controller is trying to do is have the dice fly in this configuration, land on the table, hit the wall flat, come back down to the table and keep one of these four showing faces visible. What is the impact of that? It means you haven't seen yet from me a six or a one. If the dice stay what they call on axis like this, you remove two of the six ways for a seven to show up, the one and the six and the six and the one. If a dice controller can keep the die flying on axis and land without splitting apart and going all over the place, they can stave off the seven by reducing two of the six ways that it can come. Now, that said, the dice in this configuration can still come up with a seven. You can still have the dice spin on axis and have the four, three, the five, two, and the four, three are still possibilities when the dice are on axis, but you're just, you're not getting all six of them. And that's kind of the number one goal. And whether you're throwing them horizontally like this or vertically like this, the idea is the same. You want to keep the dice kind of together, spinning on axis and not splitting apart and flying around and letting that second number match up on the second die. That's the number one way. It's on axis rolls and specifically choosing a dice set that does not have sevens available on the axis when they land. Now, a big part of that and a big trouble they have to face is controlling energy because you're throwing the dice from at least seven up to 14 feet away from the back wall. They're going to have a lot of energy. They're going to coming down with height and velocity to the table. They're going to bounce. They're going to skitter. They're going to hit the back wall. They're going to have to land again. There's a lot of energy to manage. So a dice controller or a controlled shooter is trying to impart some measure of physics to stop or disperse the energy in such a way that they don't hit the table very hard, that they don't hit the back wall very hard, and they land back again very softly. There's a lot to overcome there. The tables are bouncy, the walls got the alligator. It's, it's, a, it's a nightmare to do that, but that is what a controlled throw looks like. It's gonna be keeping the dice on axis, controlling the velocity, the impact velocity, the energy, and the amount of careening off that back wall to try and keep the dice from being a little bit less random. Dice controllers are nerds. They track everything. You'll find when we start looking at how a dice controller operates in a future video, we're gonna look at all the software that they use to track their roles and get a better idea of how they can diagnose what their dice are doing correctly and incorrectly as far as staying on axis. So it's a lot to, to manage for a dice controller to keep them where they want them, but the reward for all that time and effort, as you saw earlier, the reward is pretty big. And you can, I think, see why somebody would want to put in the time, effort, energy, and yeah, the money to try and control the dice and hold off that seven just a little bit. Well, did we solve anything? Not quite yet, but we do have a better understanding, at least I do. Um, when you take a look at what a small change to probability does, and again, going from six out of 36 to five out of 36 doesn't seem like that big of a deal when you look at it at that probability chart level, but man, when you see the way the money changed with just that small tweak by cha changing the six and the eight to being two dominant numbers over the seven, wow, what a difference in the payouts, right? I said it earlier, change the math, change the money. It's a really big deal and you can totally understand, at least I can now, why the fixation on the seven from the controlled shooting community is such a laser focus, right? If you can harness that, the impact you can have on your game and the game of everybody at the table with you is flat out enormous. Now, it's a big hill to climb. 
Okay, I showed you a really quick example with giant dice, how you can you know get a seven and and hold it off. It ain't that easy. Okay, we're gonna go in. We have two videos coming up. One where we're gonna look at all the physical ways that the table fights you as a controlled shooter. We're gonna take a look at all of the physics, how a die, how the dice bounce how they fly in the air, how they hit the wall, come off the wall and re-land. We're gonna look at slow motion video and do some trials of our own to really see how tough of a task it is and why the casinos just flat don't care that you try and control the dice because they know that table is set up to defeat it. They know that the table itself is made to ensure randomness. Can it be done? We're gonna take a hard look and find out. And then we're gonna look at a deep dive as to how a controlled shooter attempts to overcome all those physical op obstacles with physics of their own. So the next two videos back to back are going to be why it's impossible and how we try and make it possible from both ends of that thing. It's going to be a fascinating look at the mechanics of dice control. Now that we understand and I understand way better the why and the impact of why it's so important to try and achieve it. Wow. Looking into how it works is going to be fascinating. Stay tuned. It's going to be a hell of a ride. Can't wait to take it with you. And again, I'm John. This is ProCrafts. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you in our next episode in the series.